Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Monday afternoon press conference here at the 234th meeting of the American Astronomical Society at St. Louis Union Station Hotel in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm Rick Feinberg. I'm the AAS press officer. And assisting me today monitoring our webcast of the briefing is my media fellow, Carrie Hensley from Boston University. Um, if you are watching the webcast and you have the chat password, please queue up your questions for Carrie um, using the chat box. And then uh, after we do some Q&A here in the room, we'll go to you on the webcast. The way these briefings work is that we'll, um, we'll have all the panelists make their presentations one after the other. Hold your questions to the end. That way we don't step on anybody's allotment of uh, presentation time. And then um, we'll start with questions here in the room and then go to the webcast. All right, so um, this is a meeting of the American Astronomical Society in two of its divisions, the Laboratory Astrophysics Division, which is our newest division, and the Solar Physics Division, which is um, one of our very active divisions. They often meet on their own, but they often also meet with us, and that's what they're doing here. And as a result, we have a lot of talks on the sun and solar physics and the sun-earth connection. And uh, this afternoon's briefing is called What's New Under the Sun, and it's uh, four talks all about um, our favorite star, the nearest star, the sun. We're going to have four presentations. The first will be from Sanjeev Tivari from Lockheed Martin Solar and Astrophysics Laboratory. He's going to talk about fine-scale explosive energy release in the core of a solar active region. He'll be followed by Karen Muglach from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. She'll talk on the life of coronal bright points. Then we'll have Alexander Kosovichev from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. They're the folks that run the Big Bear Solar Observatory. His talk is entitled Detection of Dynamo Waves in the Solar Convection Zone by Helioseismology. And finally, something a little different from Timothy Larson, who's currently at Moberly Area Community College. He's going to speak on listening to the sun, the sonification of solar harmonics. And so with that, I will turn it over to Sanjeev, and we will get started. Thank you, Rick. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sanjeev Tiwari, and I'm going to talk about fine-scale explosive energy release in the core of the solar active region observed by high c 2.1. That is high-resolution coronal IMSER 2.1. This was a successful second high c flight uh, from White Sands last year. The first high c flight was in 2012. So we um, obtained the highest spatial resolution and temporal resolution data ever of solar active region at 1 million Kelvin for five minutes. There were other instruments co which actually co-observed with HiC, um, and uh, one of them is interface region imaging spectrograph, IRIS. Uh, so we used that data, uh, spectral data also from IRIS together with HiC2 to, to understand the smallest scale structures in the core of the active region. Active regions are the strongest magnetic field regions on the surface of the sun. They can have a strong magnetic field up to 4,000 or even more in some cases, um, which is about 10,000 times stronger than the magnetic field that we have on the Earth. Active regions are also hottest structures on, in the solar corona. If you look around the solar structure, you find any active region that will be the hottest. And not only that, the core of the active region will be even hottest. Um, among active regions as well. So this is 94, AI-94 image, and this one maps plasma, coronal plasma at 6 million Kelvin. When you look corona at 1 million Kelvin in 171, the core of the active region, the same core that was bright, brightest actually, that is not actually the brightest anymore. So we have small, tiny, cool structures, cool loops there, and high C observed this field of view of the active region, and that is where all those activities we are going to see. Um, so this is five-minute high C um, observation. You can look at the movie, and the field of interest that we have, uh, I have been working on is 
outlined by the blue box. So if you look carefully, there are so tiny um, structures, so many tiny structures everywhere in this field of view, uh, which were never, uh, most of them were never re resolved actually by earlier observations. So um, we, um, we actually found three types of dynamic small scale energy release events. So uh, just to um, remind you, this was only for five minutes and we have four seconds of guidance. So we have about 50, uh, 150 kilometers of res special resolution, which was never obtained before. So first energy release um, event was dart-like uh, structure. So these tiny darts you can see in the core of the active region, um, pointed by two arrows, if you can note. These were, these are actually, uh, for compare, uh, if you compare with Earth, these are 10 times smaller than the Earth. So their diameter is 10 times smaller than even Earth. And for comparison of this field of view, you can see Earth is uh, scaled down there. So we combined with iris data so that we have uh, transition region information as well. And then we have coronal information in hot 94 as well. So um, we, um, actually found two other type of very tiny um, scale structures. And one is these are dynamic events, basically. So these, these are loop-like events. And there is another, another third one is um, surge-like event. So there are little differences in, in these, um, these events. So for example, surge-like event looks like there are dots. There, these are like type one events, but they are not, because there is plasma outflow involved. And that we found um, after we uh, analyzed iris spectral data. So these three types of events are all, actually this was very su surprising and very interesting, um, that they are all rooted at mixed polarity magnetic field regions, all of them. So even these tiny dot-like structures smaller than, 10 times smaller than Earth, are, they are, are tiny loops which are kind of, of the size of radius of Earth, they are all, and such like events that you have plasma outflow, they have all mixed polarity field, neutral lines. So that is where your positive uh, magnetic field and negative magnetic field meet. So you have a neutral line, and those are most, that is where flux cancellation can happen. So the most important result that we find that um, different types of activity, these are small scale activities, they are all sitting at neutral line where flux cancellation is happening. When we um, try to see what is um, their thermal response and whether they are really hot, whether we, we can see some responses in chromosphere, I mean cooler atmosphere, and very hot atmosphere. So we found that, and basically the idea was to see whether they are similar to solar flares. You must have heard typical solar flares. They have very hot response in the beginning, and then there is a cooling sequence. So that kind of uh, light curve we don't see. Light curve means we, uh, we plot intensity with time. We don't see that kind of response here. So these are not typical flares. They are more uh, different kind of events. So um, we used um, high C 2.1 observations to obtain the highest spatial resolution and um, temporal guidance data um, uh, where we found the tiny uh, nano, uh, actually not nano flare, but really tiny micro flares. And we, by combination of IC uh, and IRIS, we um, this provide actually new insights into how the solar atmosphere responds to the surface magnetic field evolution. We found three times of events and they are all seated at neutral lines. So this is kind of um, very interesting that even tiny scale events are rooted at mixed polarity field and there is flux cancellation that is happening. So we pro proposed actually new formation mechanism of these events, which has to be confirmed with MSD simulations. Thank you. So good afternoon. My name is Karin Muglach. Uh, I'm giving the second presentation here. And the title of my talk is The Life of Solar Coronal Bright Points. I would like to acknowledge also my co-worker here, Andrew Leisner. He was a student uh, at Goddard Space Flight Center last summer, and he continued working with me. And he was doing most of the um, hard work of collecting all the data and data processing. 
So what you have just heard before a little bit is about solar active regions, and I would also like to uh, start off with that. So you see here an image of the sun, actually a movie of the sun in, taken with a solar dynamics observatory in the wavelength of 193. And this represents uh, the corona of the sun at a temperature of around 1.5 million Kelvin. The movie that you see is 12 days. So this is now kind of very slow evolutionary uh, development that you can see in these active regions. So all the bright regions that you see are hot magnetized plasma. And you can also see from this movie that every now and then you see some strong brightening flashing up. And you can also see then sometimes together with these fl uh, flashes that the corona opens up and you have an ejection of mass here. So uh, solar eruptive events, in particular flares and coronal mass ejections are usually found in these active regions in these hot magnetized plasmas. Now everything of this activity is basically driven by the magnetic field, and you can imagine the magnetic field as a kind of large scale three dimensional structure. And part of this structure we can see in this emission in the coronal lines. But there is only one place at the moment in the solar atmosphere where we can actually measure the magnetic field, and that is at the lower level. This is in the photospheric level. And so let me show you now a photospheric image. And actually, the same 12 days of uh, data, oops, sorry. And the same 12 days as a now magnetic movie. So you see now black and white areas, which are basically, you can imagine you have your coronal magnetic field, which goes down into the photosphere. And of course, it has a plus and minus pole like it would be for a magnetic field. And you can see that within these 12 days, uh, these active regions move around, move over the solar disk, and then actually dis disappear here. So let me state the problem now, and that is the so solar activity that we see is intimately connected to the solar magnetic field. Uh, we can only directly observe it and measure it in the photosphere. A lot of the activity, though, is up in the corona. These eruptive events are, generally speaking, uh, represent a conversion of the magnetic field uh, or the magnetic energy into the kinetic energy and uh, thermal energy of the plasma. So you have magnetic energy first, which is converted into heating as well as flows in the plasma at higher layers. So this is kind of about the level of agreement in the solar community. Uh, the Disagreement is then now in the details. And one is of the questions then that comes up is how do we build up the energy in these active regions or magnetic, magnetic systems? And then, of course, how, when, and why is the energy then released in these flares or coronal uh, mass ejections, these eruptive events? And as you have seen in the two movies I showed you before, one of the problems is that the sun is rotating. And the lifetime of these large active regions can be several days, weeks, even months. And that means they emerge, and then they rotate off. And then we have to wait about 20 days until they come back so that we can measure them again in terms of the direct measurement of the magnetic field. So any kind of active region, we only see bits and pieces of them if we want to study the magnetic evolution of them. And what I'm trying to suggest here and the aim of the project I'm doing now is how about scaling the active region down to smaller and smaller, smaller size? Because it turns out the smaller the size, the slower or the, the, the shorter the lifetime. So if I have now a very, very small active region, a kind of tiny miniature active region, it only lives a few days. And this is exactly the time scale that I need so that I continuously observe this, this miniature active region from its beginning, the very birth, all the way to its death. Uh, when it disappears. And these coronal bright points that uh, my title has about, is all about is, is kind of like a miniature active region. So in this case, I can now really study the magnetic field evolution from the very beginning all the way to the very end. And the idea is then, what can I learn from these miniature active regions that can I then transfer 
to the large-scale active regions and how do they form, how do they get energized, how do they release then the energy in eruptive events. So the way we have been doing this is we have been looking at these uh, coronal bright points and we have selected lots of them now. We have something like 70 of them where we looked at the complete uh, time evolution. Uh, this is an ongoing project, uh, it's in progress, and so I can only give you now a kind of flavor of the first results that we have seen, and I will show you two of these examples. We are going to use uh, the data from the Stolar Dynamics Observatory, again in the Corona line 193. We also added uh, another filter, which is 304. This is uh, in the layer which is between the photosphere and the, chromos uh, and the corona, which is a chromosphere. So this has a kind of medium temperature uh, plasma that you can see there. And in the lower photosphere, we're looking at magnetograms at the moment mostly, but we're also uh, working on using intensity images to get additional information on the evolution. So let me give you now a better feeling of what are the spatial scales we are looking at. Remember, you just saw the big active regions which cover a good fraction of the solar disk. What I'm looking at here is, you see the red box is my target region, and you see then very small regions that are point-like within this, this, this box here. And to zoom in a little bit more, you can see now here, these are the sizes of these coronal bright points. You see the, the, the red, uh, red circles that we have put around it. And this is a sample of four of these uh, coronal bright points that we looked in this particular um, uh, field of view that you can see here. As I said, we have now lots of them, about 70 that we have data for. Uh, we have only analyzed a few of them yet because it's a lot of data to process. So now, how does the evolution look like, really? So this is now, there has several panels here. You see on the left side, you see some line plots. So what we do here is we take one of these uh, little coronal bright points and we make a box around it, a very small box that covers just this bright point. And we sum up all the information we have there in case of the intensity images, just the photons. And the two top panels you can see of the line plots represent basically the integrated intensity in the corona. The second one in, in light blue is the intensity uh, as a function of time in, in the chromosphere, so in 304. And the, top, the, the, the bottom two panels show now the magnetic field. And the magnetic field, as I said, has usually a plus and a minus polarity. So the first panel in blue and red shows you the the plus polarity separately and the minus polarity, and how both these magnetic field information, how they change in time. And the bottom panel uh, of the line plots is now if you add up this magnetic information with a sign or unsigned. Then if it's unsigned, then you have the total magnetic flux that is changing over time. So the x-axis is time, and it is given in hours. So you can see one of this particular uh, bright point here lives about 30 hours. It's over a day. So let's look at the movies. And I have here the 2D movies. So again, uh, this one here in, in uh, uh, gray, the first one you see is in 193. The red one is in, one, uh, in 304. And the bottom one is given is the magnetic field information that you have. So this is 30 hours of data. Basically one image every few minutes that I can show here. So you see there we start out with basically nothing and then this bright area comes up. So this is how a typical nice little bright point looks like. It changes all kinds of information and now it just starts to get much bigger. So this was an eruption that you could just see. And then you see it starts fading out, gets smaller and smaller again. And near the end of it, you will see then another one of these eruptive events. Now where we go. And then finally it is gone again. So let me play this again. And now you can also pay attention not just to the coronal images, you can also have a look at the magnetic field information. And the magnetic field information is in the uh, black and white lower panel. So we start over again from the beginning. 
And what you can see now, I can point out now in the magnetogram, so when the intensity goes up, you can actually see some black and white bipole coming up. So this is basically the, the emergence phase of the bright point. And together with the emerging of the flux, both as a bipolar plus minus region, you can see that the intensity then in the corona and the chromosphere also goes up. So this is the kind of birth phase of this particular, active, uh, uh, particular bright point. Then the magnetic field has emerged. It see that it's suddenly getting compressed and moving together. And while it's moving together, the plus and minus slowly cancel out, and you get less and less and less magnetic field, and at the same time, you get less and less in intensity. So this compression or this, this moving together of the magnetic field is a so-called cancellation or fade-out phase. And this is then eventually when the bright point dies. I would like to show you one other example. So here is basically a summary of what I said. So we have a bipolar flux emergence during uh, the emergence phase to give birth to the bright point. And then later we have a cancellation phase where the magnetic field goes away, the intensity goes down, and we also have eruptive events during this phase. Here is a second one that I would like to show. And this is quite interesting because it shows a few different things. The very early, very early phase is very similar. If you look, at it, we start out with nothing, then you can see the uh, bright point coming up, and at the same time you have flux emergence in the magnetic field. So this is kind of very similar to what we had before. So the birth event of this particular bright point has also flux emergence. Then it's just staying there for quite a while and not doing really any much. But uh, you should look uh, in the top part of the panels now, soon. Oh, here we come. So we have another bright point coming up. So there is a little smaller additional bright point that is appearing north of the original one. You see it both in intensity and in the magnetic field. It's actually swept now south towards the main uh, uh, bright point. And as soon as it's starting to interact with that, it starts to set off one eruptive event after the other. So here there was one. And if you go through the whole event series, you can see there are six of these jets and six of these eruptive events coming up. And every time you see mass that is going to be thrown out, you see magnetic flux is getting less and less. It's canceling out. There is another one. And finally, very slowly, but clearly, the actual magnetic bright point dies out. And eventually, most of the bipolar flux is then gone as soon as the, 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 the black and white is uh, gone, at least the white is gone, you see that there's some leftover black flux, but there is no opposite polarity left. And this is when the completely the uh, bright point has died out. So this is uh, in, in, so in how far very interesting because in the first emergence phase that you can see, it's just the bright point itself showing up. It, it, it emits in, 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 in the radiation, in the corona, but it doesn't show any eruptive events. It's only when the second bright point uh, emerges uh, and then comes in close enough to interact with the pre-existing pre structure, only then you actually start to see all the activity. And as you can see, this is an extremely active bright point, so it has six eruptive events uh, during the fade-out phase. And this is actually quite a lot. And there's a whole kind of fireworks of, of jets coming out of this. So this is, uh, for now, everything I wanted to tell you. I wanted to show these two examples. We have lots and lots of more. And after analyzing all of them, I think I can then probably give you more conclusive answers on statistics, on how often happens, you know, how many of these jets happen. Do we see them in a different way, and so on. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, my name is Alexander Kosovichev. 
And my presentation is about um, uh, global solar activity and in particular phenomena inside the sun. Um, that, um, particularly, it's, uh, my presentation relates to the origin of um, solar activity cycles. It's been known for a long time that uh, solar activity has a um, um, period of sunspot appear with periods of 11 years. Uh, but the questions are what uh, process inside sun controls the strength of these cycles and how we can predict uh, the future sunspot maxima. And this picture you can see that there are two periods of, several, three periods of low soil activity, Mounder minimum, Dalton minimum, and now there is indication that uh, we are going into a new modern uh, solar minimum. And in particular, uh, uh, the solar magnetic field, it shows also interesting patterns. Here you can see the solar magnetic field measured in the past four cycles, and in the central of this image, uh, that is formed by a butterfly diagram, it's uh, the sunspots emerge in the butterfly diagram. At the same time, polar magnetic field also changes with a um, period of 11 years. And it's been found empirically that uh, polar magnetic field in uh, solar minimum predicts, correlates with the uh, uh, strength of the next solar maximum. There is no one-to-one -one correspondence, but there is a uh, relationship. And our analysis uh, provides an uh, explanation, a butterfly diagram, and um, uh, this, this relationship between polar magnetic field and uh, the sunspot cycles. How we look inside the sun, uh, we measure solar oscillations, the acoustic waves that are trapped inside the sun, excited by turbulent convection, and they form resonant modes. And by measuring frequencies of these modes, we can infer internal structure and dynamics of the sun. And in particular, these measurements that I, I will show, it's a measurements of um, zonal flows. It's a stream jets inside the sun. And uh, the general idea is that stream jets are modulated by magnetic fields. So by tracking the stream jets, uh, we can um, learn about um, evolution of magnetic field inside the sun. And in this work, uh, the dynamo waves, that magnetic, uh, the magnetic uh, activity of the sun, global magne magnetic activity, is controlled by um, hydromagnetic waves, they call dynamo waves. That um, uh, waves that are generated by uh, turbulent convection inside the sun and travel through the convection zone. So we track the evolution of these uh, uh, magnetic uh, wave, waves uh, by measuring evolution of uh, the subsurface flows, zonal flows. So this analysis allows us to uh, pin down location where the actually solar cycle gener uh, generated at the bottom of the convection zone. And it turns out it happens at uh, the bottom of the convection zone, 120,000 miles beneath the solar surface and at about 60 degrees latitude. And uh, then these uh, giant waves of um, solar magnetism, the blast uh, from the bottom of the convection zone, travel to the surface. And uh, here you can see on this picture, you can see uh, that when the cycle 24 started at, um, at the bottom of the convection zone, but cycle 23, these blue regions, they show deceleration of these flows. It's progressing on the solar surface at low latitudes, forming the butterfly diagram. I'll, uh, let me show the movie of these waves. They've actually been observed since uh, 1996 uh, from two NASA spacecraft to measure solar oscillations continuously uh, for more than 20 years. And here you can see the blue arrows, they show deceleration, that where the zone of flows are, are slowed down by magnetic field. And red shows the acceleration. Um, so this, um, uh, you can see again how this um, flows, this um, picture on the left shows that uh, sunspot number. And you can see that uh, how this um, wave that starts at uh, high latitudes and then travel down, they migrate, uh, towards the equator, and uh, a solar cycle progresses. So this picture again shows um, that, um, that another view of these uh, dynamo waves. And again, so they detected through measurements of zonal deceleration because magnetic field slows down the flow speed. And uh, they uh, originate at the bottom of the convection zone, 120 miles beneath solar surface at about um, 60 degrees uh, latitude. The red arrow shows here uh, the primary seed 
of solar dynamo, where the magnetic field is uh, generated, amplified, and uh, then um, uh, we are able to track uh, migration of the dynamo waves. In this picture, arrow shows uh, that um, migration that what was tracked on series of images of uh, subsurface flows. And um, they start what the bottom convection zone called, so called solar tahak line. And uh, the waves, they travel the speed of uh, uh, between two and four miles per hour. And they reach very quickly the polar regions. In one, two years, they reach polar regions. But it takes about 10 years uh, to reach uh, the mid-latitudes uh, where the sunspots originate. Uh, so this uh, explains this delay that why these uh, polar regions, the polar magnetic field, actually predicts the following uh, solar cycle. It's again that, uh, uh, that a lot of things happens on the, when these waves travel to the surface, so there is no one-to-one -one correspondence that also has shown observations. But this is a good indication of the next of the, of the strength of the next of solar cycle. And uh, this picture on the top, it shows again this blue where the flows is um, uh, uh, slowed down by magnetic field. And we can see migration with depths. It's a vertical scale here from the bottom convection zone to the surface, and horizontal scale is time. So we can get progression of the uh, current solar cycle 24, where the polar magnetic field migrated towards the surface. And we can see the future solar cycle it's already appeared in polar regions on the surface, and it's substantially slow. There's, uh, the flow uh, reacts substantially slowly uh, to the magnetic field. So it indicates that uh, the next solar cycle is likely to be significantly weaker than the current solar cycle. Uh, so I repeat the bottom picture here. It shows the sunspot number in, uh, the, uh, in the last two cycles. And the dash curve shows um, the flow deceleration uh, 120,000 miles beneath the solar surface. And we already see the next solar maximum there in flows. And uh, here that's, uh, that's a flow deceleration, so it's a negative minima correspond to the uh, solar sunspot maxima. And uh, we can see that it's substantially lower, the cycle 25. So that's, what, that's an indication that uh, the internal flows indicate that uh, there will be further decrease of uh, solar activity, so feel the decline of solar activity. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Tim Larson, and I am indeed an instructor at Moberly Area Community College here in Missouri. I also got my PhD studying global helioseismology. However, I started the Sonification of Solar Harmonics project with a couple of composers, these guys, uh, Seth Schaefer and Elaine DeFalco. And Rick told you that my presentation is going to be a little bit different, and the main difference is that this is a presentation for everybody. You're going to understand everything I'm about to tell you, and <clears throat> everything I'm going to show you is freely available for download, and all of you can download it and use it. So uh, <clears throat> the oscillations that Sasha was talking about were actually first discovered in 1960. Um, when it was uh, seen that the surface of the sun was moving up and down with a period of about five minutes. And eventually it was decided that uh, this oscillation, uh, it would, this oscillation was explained as the result of sound waves trapped in the solar interior. Um, so yeah, that's right. The solar, the sun is actually a resonant cavity for really low frequency sound waves. And because these sound waves propagate through the interior, the frequencies uh, tell us um, about uh, what's going on inside the sun. Um, so although we've been studying this data for decades, um, we almost never listened to it. Um, but now uh, the SOCH project has developed a software tool that lets everybody do just that. So as I said, uh, the strongest of the sun's harmonics have a period of about five minutes, which corresponds to a frequency of only about three millihertz, which is far, far below the range of human hearing, which is usually in the hundreds of hertz or maybe thousands of hertz, which is already pretty high. 
Uh, so if you want to measure a five minute oscillation, it's common to make a measurement once a minute, uh, which would correspond to a sample rate of 1 60th of a hertz. However, uh, an audio player will not give you any audio uh, sample rate less than about 8,000 hertz. So in this situation, that means that uh, you got a minimum speed up factor of 480,000. And <clears throat> at this rate, uh, a year's worth of data, you could hear it in about a minute, which is one of the major advantages of sonification. Uh, however, um, often this transposition factor is too high, and so one of the things the social tool lets you do is to uh, transpose shift the frequency independent of the sample rate. And as long as you transpose every one of the solar harmonics the same, then the musical intervals between them will be preserved, which obviously is of interest to composers who might want to use the sun as a musical instrument. So back to the science, um, helioseismology, how it works in general. Uh, we start with velocity images of the sun's surface. Uh, we decompose each of these images into its spherical harmonic components. More on that in just a second. Um, for each of these spherical harmonics, we make a time series of its amplitude, and then we do an analysis to measure its harmonic content, basically just figure out how much of each frequency is in that time series. And because the different harmonics uh, inhabit different regions inside the sun, here this shows the depth dependence. You can see how some of them stay close to the surface, while others of them like penetrate more deeply. And so it's because the different harmonics inhabit different regions that we can use their um, frequencies to infer things like solar rotation inside the sun. Now, right, I'm going to play for you a unfiltered time series. This is a single spherical harmonic time series to show you what we're starting with. So this is all the frequency contents playing at once. Not very pleasant to listen to, right? Oops. Okay. Good. So the surface behavior of a solar harmonic is a special function of latitude and longitude, which we call spherical harmonics. Spherical harmonics are described by two integers. They're L and M. L is the number of node lines on the surface of the sphere. A node line is simply a place where the amplitude is zero. That's what these white lines in the figure are. And the harmonic degree L tells you how many total are on the surface of the sphere. Uh, M tells you how many there are in longitude. And so the number in latitude is simply L minus M. Now, there's also nodes in the radial direction, but of course we can't see that, we only see the surface. So on the next slide, I'll show you uh, some examples of radial eigenfunctions, which give the interior behavior, and they're described by a radial order n, which gives the number of nodes along a radius. So here's two examples. On the left, I have uh, plotted n equals three, just so you can see it. You can see the three circular, you can see the three, oh, I lost the curse, you can see the, the three circular uh, node, the three node circles. Um, but this uh, mode actually has a frequency that's too low for us to measure. I plotted it so you could see it. Over here on the right is n equals 20. This is a mode we could easily measure, but as you can see, the nodes become too close to each other near the surface to see at this scale. But in any case, the important thing to remember is that the total harmonic will be a product of a spherical harmonic, which is a function on the surface, and this function of depth. It's the two multiplied together that give you the total mode. So here's an example of how the mode frequencies, uh, or how the different harmonics inhabit different regions of the sun. So on the top row, we have the surface view for L equals 25, starting from M equals zero going across. You can see as M gets closer to L that uh, the mode stays closer and closer to the equator. And down below, I have the same two values of N, three and uh, 20. And you can see that as you go up in frequency or up in N for a given L that the mode goes deeper. So <clears throat> now um, the spherical harmonics, we have a different spherical harmonic for each L and M, but to measure N, we've got to do some Fourier analysis, form a power spectrum. What I've shown you here is actually an amplitude spectrum zoomed in on just one value of N for an L of 10 and M of zero that I chose at random. So the blue line here is the data and the orange line is the fit to the data. And so the thing about helioseismology is it works all in terms of mode parameters. So basically it, it studies the orange line here. 
you know, and, and typically just the, the peak frequency here is, is what we use for do helioseismic conversion. We measure the amplitude and the width of this peak, but as you can see, there's a lot more going on here, you know, a lot more information contained in the data than is captured by this simple mode fit. And that's what the SOCH tool allows you to do. It allows you to listen to the actual data that we took. And this, and what's shown here is a good example of a filter window that we might use. So what we do is we zoom in on a mode in frequency space, and we set all the other frequencies to zero, and then we transform back into the time domain. And the result would be something like this. This is, again, L equals five, M equals three. And I just picked, um, and I just picked N equals 17 and 21. These have been transposed by a factor of 135,000 and brings them up to about 375 and 448 hertz. So just an example. So, um, so far we've used data from two instruments, um, the same ones that uh, Sasha was talking about, uh, MDI, which took data for 15 years um, at a cadence of 60 seconds. In 2010, it was superseded by uh, HMI, which takes data every 45 seconds and is operating still today. Now, MDI has been sonified sporadically in the past. In fact, by Sasha himself, who was the one who most famously did it. Um, but now that can be done interactively. And so far, the Soch project is the only people who have sonified HMI data and the only sonification of two full solar cycles of data spanning both instruments. So moving forward, um, already available is the Soch Pi visualization package. It made most of the figures that I've showed you. Um, we're developing a mobile app to give people a way to explore the, um, the way the amplitude of modes varies inside the sun. My collaborators are working on planetarium presentations in virtual reality environments um, where you can, with ambisonic audio to like spatially separate the different modes. Um, my own personal ambition is to maybe use some of the experience I've got in global, sonifying global helioseismic data and maybe use it to sonify local helioseismic data. And so maybe one day it could be possible to hear a solar flare. Um, but very soon, what's coming up real soon is um, we're going to be flooding SoundCloud with all kinds of nature sounds, but of the sun. And so very soon we will find out just what people can hear in it. Thank you very much. Thank you guys very much. All right, we'll go to uh, questions. We'll start here in the room, and uh, I'd like you to uh, wait for a microphone. I'm being assisted here with the mic by Trey Winter. He is the Solar Physics Division's volunteer press officer. So wait for the mic, and when you get it, please identify yourself and tell us who you're asking a question of, and then uh, we will go to the webcast. Okay, questions here in the room? All right, we'll start here and then go down the line. So Sanjiv. Can you please tell us who you are? And uh, I'm David Ravahi from Michigan. The, um, the question I have is uh, if we could have an instrument up longer than just five minutes, yeah. th that would be a useful thing? Yes. Okay, so would is it only uh, you have to clear the atmosphere or is it like orbit? Where, where would be <coughs> an optimal place for an instrument that would be measuring continuously? Yeah, so there are already some instruments like Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's giving um, um, every 12 seconds there is uh, coronal data available in multiple wavelengths. So there are different places like L1 is uh, one. There are uh, instruments and there are other places where um, which could be geostationary basically. There are so many satellites. So uh, those can be observing sun almost uh, all the time. And this is already happening. There are, this is uh, the images that Karen also shows. Uh, showed actually, and I also showed um, full disk solar image. So that is continuously, uh, um, uh, we are getting those images continuously, but the idea was to see really smaller uh, scale structures, find in fine details what is happening. And for that, of course, there are some technology limitations that we don't have yet for full disk, uh, that kind of images. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, over here. Uh, Daniel Debout, Canada, France, Hawaii Telescope. Uh, my question is for uh, Alexander. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, you predict a, a lesser solar maximum for cycle 25. How much less is it going to be? Do you have an idea of the order of magnitude? Uh, it's, uh, the, this flow measurement, it shows that um, 
roughly half, maybe half, 60 half percent yeah, of, <coughs> of current solar cycle. And from that and other data, can you, uh, can you predict it? Can you predict better if we're going to a minimum and how much, how much this minimum is going to be? <coughs> well, currently the best predictions are made by uh, measure, uh, comparing with uh, polar magnetic field. I believe we'll be on, on uh, Wednesday will be press conference about this, about prediction based on polar magnetic field. And <coughs> our prediction is made first by, by um, first, first prediction made by measuring something inside the sun, by measuring uh, the strength of um, subsurface flows. And uh, here uncertainty, one of the uncertainties is that um, <coughs> uh, these flows they interact uh, with magnetic field in a turbulent environment. And uh, we still don't quite understand the relationship between these. So there is a strong indication that <coughs> the next solar cycle will be weaker. But how much, it's um, difficult to it's say. It's hard to say. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Andrew Fracknoy, freelance. Um, I have a question for Timothy. I'm asking this as a person who catalogs astronomical music on the web. Mm -hmm. I was, at the end, a little confused. Will this actually turn into music? You mentioned your co-authors were composers. They are both composers. So what is their role in the project? And uh, tell us more about how this is something that might lead to music. Well, I've been trying to get helioseismologists uh, interested in this for quite a while, completely failing. And I, um, so I, it was, it was brought up to my attention again by actually Elaine DeFalco, who um, was composing something for a master's thesis at the time. Um, but they turned me on to this new free software platform. It's called Pure Data. It's, it's a visual programming language. A lot of uh, musicians use it for live performances. But it's free, and it comes with this graphical interface. And so that is actually what the social tool is written in. Um, anyway, and so once I had this little start, then I've, I've really just run with it. And it's actually taught me a lot about like where, about what a solar mode is, and uh, like how it is that we analyze the data. I mean, there's, it's, it's pretty complex. And actually, I designed the social tool to really closely mimic the steps in the scientific global helioseismic analysis. So we really are listening to like the data that we analyze. So we're actually, so we, we take the Fourier transform over 72 days, which you would never do to listen to it. <laughs> um, but I do that to preserve the full phase information. So when you start adding modes together, which is another thing the social tool lets you do. It lets you listen to these modes singly and it lets you add them together, concatenate them. Um, so there, there's a lot of different tools in the package, and you can, um, yeah, you can write music with it, um, but you can also hear physical effects like solar rotation. You can hear the small frequency separation in it, which tells you a little bit about the solar core. Um, there's different things that, I mean, we're just now starting to explore the sound space. So would the sun get us a uh, songwriting credit? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions in here? Not right now. Do we have any on the web? OK. OK, this is a question from Rick Lovett, freelance for Karen. Um, is the goal of this to get closer to predicting big flares and CMEs? And if so, can you elaborate on how this scales up or how you will be working to scale it up? Um, yes, so the idea is definitely to find out at what stage in the life of an active region can we expect flares and CMEs, as I said, by downscaling it and looking at uh, uh, coronal bright points. And what we've seen up to now already, it seems like in the emergence phase, there is not much going on in terms of eruptive ev events. And if you look at the literature, a lot of the numerical models that exist for these jets actually do uh, model these eruptive events in the emergence phase, which seems not very, at the moment, compatible with our observations. But again, I haven't looked at, at enough events to make a firm conclusion on that. In the end, yes, we would like to see if we can scale this up uh, to the larger events, especially flares and CMEs. And um, what we are most, what I think uh, I can do 
most likely is figuring out what's happening in the photosphere that might be a driver or what might be the trigger for these uh, events. I think, uh, again, the, the coronal response is ha happening much higher up. And you can look at that in, in the, and, and these, the coronal events are, are very quick. So you can, you can look, use snapshots for that. But how to build up the energy that is something that's happening longer term, and you can then look, in this case, in the photosphere and, and the photospheric drivers in a, in a much better way. And as I said, we have coronal images. We can also use um, the stereo images, which allow us to look at the corona on the far side, so when the thing is rotating off. But we cannot look at the photosphere as soon as the active region has rotated off. And so that's the, 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 big, the, big, the biggest advantage of, using, uh, of uh, looking at the small-scale regions. Anything else? I have a few questions. Um, so my first question uh, is for Sanjeev and Karen. You both talked about points, but I gather that you're talking about points of different scales and different durations. But I'm wondering um, if you can explain Band a little on you know sort of what what are the relationships or the differences between the two different kinds of brightenings and and uh, you know small features that you're looking at and and what if anything you've been able to tell from looking at them uh, that they might contribute to heating the corona or is that just an unrelated issue? Yeah. So as you said, yes, they they are at different scales. So the dots that I showed, they are. Um, as I said, they are just uh, um, even smaller than, 10 times smaller than Earth radius. Their radius is um, very small. Um, so what Karin was talking, those um, active regions, tiny active regions are small active regions in the beginning of um, uh, flux emergence that she showed. They look like uh, dots, not dots, but they are known as bright points, basically. They are really huge. They are still, um, I don't know, maybe 100 times uh, not 100 times, but about 10 times maybe bigger than um, our dot-like uh, structures, yeah. Compa um, comparable in size to Earth, it sounds like, roughly? Yes, yeah, roughly. Yeah, it's about, about um, size of the Earth, or so a few times size of the okay. Earth. Yeah. yeah, so 10 to 20 times in that range. Uh, so those are uh, slightly different because these events are not exactly formed due to flux emergence. So that is the basic difference, mm -hmm. I see. Um, and what bright point C is, those are due to flux emergence. And what we see is, this, this is due to flux cancellation. So uh, that is what we interpret. So there are fundamental differences, and we think that most of the heating that we, um, uh, we have other studies also in the past, um, and we find that most of the heating in coronal loops, bigger loops, or even tiny scale uh, things, those are related to flux cancellation mostly. Although when flux emerges, you have bright points, mm -hmm. but the more transient events, which, which have lifetime of one minute, two minutes, and that range are three minutes, even larger ones, some of them, they are mostly when there is flux cancellation and magnetic topology suddenly changes. Mm -hmm. So that, those are more transient ones. Okay. And when you use the term flux cancellation, what's the relationship between that and a term that I'm more used to hearing, magnetic reconnection? Is it the same thing or is it so, Two different things. So flux cancellation happens on the surface of the sun. And reconnection, magnetic field lines, reconnection happens mostly in the corona, in okay. higher into corona. So when you have a field, two field lines, let us say, and they reconnect, they form two other field lines, mm -hmm. a smaller one and another, which, is, uh, which can be larger often. So the smaller one gets, because of uh, stronger magnetic tension forces, often that gets uh, submerged into the photosphere, and that mm -hmm. is what flux cancellation is. Okay. So reconnection often happens in the higher atmosphere, higher atmosphere, and higher mm -hmm. corona, or chromosphere, uh, but flux cancellation is different when you see flux uh, um, disappearing on the surface. These okay. are related. Okay, but yes. it's still, it's opposite polarities of magnetic field that's <laughs> at the core of what's going on in both cases, it sounds like. So, right. um, I'm trying to understand because no, I don't yeah. really know solar physics. No, no, <laughs> sure. So flux cancellation, you have opposite polarity uh, fields which have to be together and sheared to disappear, to cancel with each other and disappear. 
But for reconnection, you don't need to have that. For example, there is nano flare mechanism mm -hmm. um, proposed by Parker, and he doesn't require flux cancellation. So basically, you have feed lines in corona, you have braiding. And these braiding, when, because you have convection, so these braided structures can reconnect uh, um, slowly or fast. They can be fast also, but nano flares are really uh, slow. These are ohmic dissipation thing. So they can reconnect there without requiring um, mixed polarity field. Okay. So these are reconnection is basically in two feed lines. If there are two feed lines like this, and they meet somewhere, if there is enough tension in them, magnetic energy can be released by reconnection, and then it is hot, it is bright, it, it dissipates magnetic energy. Mm -hmm. So uh, that is reconnection. Um, it doesn't require mixed polarity field. Okay. Anything else online? Okay, got another question coming from the webcast. Question for Timothy from Doyle Rice at USA Today. Hmm. At a very basic layman level, what is it that we were hearing when we were listening to the sun sounds? Uh, you are the the motion of the sun's surface. Cool. It, that, that's that's the the short answer. I mean, we, we we take these images of the sun. You know, we decompose them into their components, which is like a, a spatial filter that we like, like. You're putting a spatial filter onto the surface of the sun, <clears throat> and then you form a time series using that spatial filter, and then you can do. Um, a frequency analysis that lets you um, put a frequency filter on, and then that was the last thing that, that we heard. So the first thing that I played for you was just the spatial filtering, no frequency filtering. And then I took that same thing and applied frequency filtering to pick out two of the peaks in it. Okay, we have one. Trey, do you still have a mic? Thank you. David Rabahi of Michigan again. I'm curious if it's possible to create um, these magnetic effects in the laboratory, or do we, we just can't make strong enough magnetic fields? How, how does that work? Um, there are some laboratory experiments. Um, so there are some MHD simulations, basically. There are also some experiments going on, but more, more uh, MHD simulations are uh, there in, in big computer. You use, of course, require big computers, and then you can reproduce by using all those MHD equations, you can reproduce um, uh, small-scale reconnections. So that we are able to see. Uh, there are some uh, simulation groups who have actually very efficiently, we can, although they don't start from the scratch, that is the problem. There are some where you have, uh, they, can, they can produce magnetic field lines, and then they, uh, they twist it um, manual, uh, not manually by, by uh, known process, and then they relax it. So there are some, um, some reconnection that happens in that way, and they try to understand how much energy is released and so on. But uh, yes, there are limitations. Of course, you, we don't have that. Sun is our closest laboratory. We don't have anything of that size that we can do on, uh, on the Earth, but uh, there are different things like Reynolds number, is a parameter that uh, that cannot be optimized in any laboratory. So there are similar other limitations that we cannot really produce the same thing. But yes, there are efforts on MSD simulation side that they are trying to reproduce some some of those. Um, they are getting closer in in many cases. Um, there are some real MSD simulations of sunspots, for example, and they are now extending it to Corona. So their physics is more complicated, um, but there work there are works going on. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, it's about 4 o'clock, so I think we should uh, close out the briefing. I want to thank our speakers again uh, for their very interesting and uh, uh, audible presentations. <laughs> um, we could hear it. Uh, and I want to let the uh, press corps know that there's, uh, I think, just one press release going out from this briefing, uh, but that should be winging its way to you shortly if it hasn't already arrived uh, via the AAS press list. Um, tomorrow we will have two more briefings. The first one uh, tomorrow morning at 11 central time here uh, is on spiral galaxies near and far. And then the next two briefings after that will feature more results from solar physics division related papers. So uh, there's going to be yet more uh, of what's new under the sun. So thanks again for coming and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Bye-bye.